Oh, well, it is good to have everyone back. We are in a five-week, this is the final week in this study about the Reformation because October 31st uh, was the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. And so you say, well, what does that matter? But in reality, what the Reformation did was through the central truths, the central Christian truths and doctrines about God back into the center of discussion in the church after it had been growing and being veiled more and more over a thousand-year period. And so by the time the Reformation comes, they're not out to leave the church, they're out to reform it, and they bring back these things, and we've looked at several of them, sola fide, that's Latin, right, for faith alone. Did you know I was reading a a guy this week, and he was kind of making fun of that, he said, you know, of those who claim to be Christians around this world, only 20% of Christians on this planet believe in faith alone. The other 80% believe it's faith plus works. And so I would encourage you to go back to the scriptures and look very closely at what we're talking about, right? Because there's a lot of things that we understand in life that we have to be pretty specific about. If your boss tells you, you start a new job and you have to run the computer, you have to do this, we go, oh, I had to be very specific. When, you have, when you're looking at various things, you're looking to buy a new car, you do a lot of investigation, there's nothing that you should investigate more thoroughly than what God has said about himself and about eternity and about how to be made right with him. And so we've looked at sola fide, or by faith alone. We've looked at in Christ alone, just as the video this morning. A lot of people go, hey, it's just what? It doesn't matter the object of faith, just as long as you have faith. And we've said that's not true. It's faith in Christ alone. It's by grace alone. It is not uh, somehow that God's grace empowers us, so it's sort of this cooperation that God does part of it and we do part of it, it's totally 100% undeserved that we get to be saved, that we get to have a relationship with the living God. 100% is God. And so we need to look at these things and the Reformation threw it back into the center piece of the spotlight within the church. But in reality, if you look at Pew Research Studies and such today, you realize we really need a modern day reformation to go back to these truths that are found in the word of God. So we're looking at the fifth sola or only or alone. So the fifth alone, this is, that is that all of this, the, the first four solas, sola fide, by faith alone, and grace alone, and Christ alone, by the word alone, that they all lead to the fifth. That is, that it's for the glory of God alone. And you would say, everyone understands that, right? It's, it's for the glory of God alone, but we don't. We don't. We should, but oftentimes we don't. It's for the glory of God alone. So the first four solas lead to the fifth, that is the glory of God alone. Because in Martin Luther's day, who started the Reformation with the 95 Thesis, you had the you had all of these distortions and what they were really doing is robbing God of his glory. So instead of scripture alone being the final authority for the church, you had the Pope, you had councils, you had the church father, you had all these things. And before long, the the scriptures as the authority were way down the list. And what that does is it robs God of his glory. If there's anything you don't want to be said of you is that you rob God of glory, right? But in in actuality, every one of these things, if you, we say faith alone, and you say, well, no, faith is good, but... uh, you know, it's faith plus doing this, plus doing that, which, by the way, 74% of evangelical Christians believe that it's faith plus something. The problem is, you know what Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 7, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. What is he talking about? He's saying that many people, many Christians will die, will stand there wanting to come into the kingdom, and Jesus will look at them and say, you're going to depart from me because I never, ever knew you. I never knew you. And based on statistics, it's frightening how many Christians are really not Christian at all. Frightening. It should should terrify us that many, many people who claim to know Christ do not love Christ. That they don't love the word, that they are not enamored with a God who did 100%, but they're still actually believing themselves to be pretty good, and that their good works are getting them into heaven, even though Romans 4 said, if you try to earn your way into heaven, I'll give you what you earn, but it's never going to be heaven. It's critical. But undergirding all of these things is this idea that everything God has done is for his glory. So God is for who? God is for God. I hope to make that case this morning. God is for God. You see, when we are rightly in tune to the scriptures, 
the glory of God becomes the hallmark of our lives, the, the overriding principle, the, the undergirds everything. Why do we come and sing? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we do all these things? Why do we seek to love our enemies? Why do we care for the poor? Why do we do all these things? Undergirding all of these things is a desire for the glory of God. And that's a radical departure from culture. In fact, culture says the end of man is happiness. The end goal of all mankind, they would say, is happiness. Declaration of Independence. I like the Declaration of Independence, but if you think about it, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness has become the overriding theme of life. What do I, what do I hope to get out of life? Well, everything goes back to happiness. In fact, uh, to give you a, a, a sort of a strange example, this week I got a text from someone here, and they were texting me an article from Florida where this uh, large white male is, um, I was being interviewed. And uh, he is transgender, so he believes he's transitioned from one gender to the other. So now he's a, apparently believes himself to be a large white male, a uh, white female. But he's not just transgender, he believes he's transracial. So he believes he's uh, Filipino. So he believes he's a Filipino woman, all right? So if you looked at this rather large white guy with red hair, you wouldn't immediately clue into, yeah, I get that, Filipino woman, right? But when they were interviewing him, they said, well, have you told your family? Well, I told them that I was transgender. I haven't told them I'm transracial because they're going to laugh at me. But what's the big deal? I'm just driving at my happiness. This is, who would talk, who would say anything against it? Because this is what makes me happy. So while that's an extreme example what happens is a lot of times man's main goal is happiness. His main goal is happiness. Be careful. While we use an extreme example, maybe in some ways happiness is our main goal. But happiness, as we all know, is pretty fleeting, isn't it? You ever had a really great day, sun shining, maybe it was a Saturday you had off, you're drinking some iced tea, you're relaxing, everything's going well until someone makes a comment. Or until somebody cuts you off in traffic. What happens to happiness? It can be gone like that, right? It's pretty cheap. What God is directing our lives to is through holiness, through pursuit of his glory, he's driving us at joy. Joy isn't cheap or short-lived. Joy understands that God undergirds everything that he's doing for his glory, that it all somehow fits in with his sovereign design and plan and will. And the more that our lives say, man, this is weighty, but I live for the glory of God, and then I'm not making my decisions based on does it make me happy, because a lot of things that God said will not make you happy but they will bring you joy, something much deeper, much more lasting, something that someone cutting you off in traffic won't take from you, or that snide remark or that sarcastic comment can't evaporate. It's joy. It's deep. It's lasting. God is driving at our joy by ultimately focusing on everything is about God. It's from him, for him, and to him. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's what Romans 11 says. So we're going to look at this idea that we exist to glorify God. I hope that when we leave here, you say, man, I exist. I exist to glorify God, that God is for God, and I exist to glorify God. Hmm. And so that we don't fall prey to that, because it's not just way out there examples, like this idea of being trans, not only transgender, but now transracial, which is being uh, becoming a big push, right? Because in a day where high happiness is the great goal, it doesn't even matter what's true anymore, right? It only matters what makes me happy. But if you look at what happened if the church also made happiness the end goal, what would you expect to happen? You would expect more and more sermons to talk only on one side of it. God's for you. God loves you. God, God's with you. God, that's all true, isn't it? That's all true. But if you only hear that, you would assume that, yeah, I'm something. Man, I'm great, as one preacher said. Man, you, you, it's like even in churches sometimes we have, man, you're varsity. You're not JV. You're varsity. Man, don't let anybody tell you you're not varsity. Don't let us a slap in your you know, beautiful, unique face. Well, that preacher did a good job of pointing back to saying, wait a minute. What if the end goal was that God was for God? 
What if the end goal was that really it wasn't us being amazing, it's him being amazing? What if instead of having everything oriented around me, 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 which by research they say the most popular churches in America are the ones that require the least of people. What if the church began, just as Paul said would happen, that everybody was out to have their ears tickled? You give me some feeling, I just I go to church to be happy. What if Christians actually embraced that? Would they really be following God's plan? Can we really orient everything to, oh, we'll give you everything. We'll, we'll make everything just how you want it. That way you'll learn that life isn't about you. Is that really the goal? You see, if the goal is to live a selfless life, you would expect that we would hear all of God's message and that we would be called to sacrificial lives, to love and forgive and to give and to help and to care for and to minister grace, not because we feel like it, not because that will make me happy, but rather that will glorify God and that's why I'm created. So I hope to show you some things through the scriptures because I I'd never want you to say, man, he said it, it must be true. I will get it wrong. So <laughs> I would hope that you're like the Bereans and you're reading the Bible, reading the Bible. And I know we say that all the time, but, and I know it's not easy, right? Because you woke up going, oh, man, I was so going to read the Bible this morning. And, oh, man, I'm already late for work. Grab the coffee out the door, right? And you, you were going to read the Bible when you got home. That was like the first thing until, man, you were tired and you were hungry. And then you, you, know, you turn the TV on. And then next thing you know, you fell asleep. And you, you know what I'm saying? You have to battle. This is a spiritual battle to get in the word, to, to really believe that he's speaking and wants you to listen to him daily, meet with him daily. So we exist to glorify God. Isaiah 43, I just want to show you some ways that, that God is for God, that we, are to, we exist for his glory. Isaiah 43, 7, you don't have to turn all these places because there's all a bunch of them, but you can, uh, 43, 7 says, everyone who's called by my name and whom I have created for my for my glory. Why did he create mankind? For his, for his glory. Isaiah 49.3, he says this of Israel and why he chose the nation Israel. He says this in 49.3, he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. So why did he create us? His glory. Why did he choose Israel? His glory. Or in Psalm, in chapter 106 of Psalms in verse 47, he says this, 106, 47 of Psalms, save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from among the nations to give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Why do they, why are they petitioning God to, to, to pull them back out of these nations, which they were sent there for what? Their disobedience. He says, pull us out of those nations, bring us back to being the people of God for your glory. So at the end of the day, he didn't create us for us. He created us for his glory. He didn't save us for us. He saved us for his glory. At the end of the day, he didn't re pull them back out of the nations for, them, for their happiness, but for his glory. Or in case you're thinking, man, there's a lot of Old Testament passage. I get it, but we're in the New Testament. We're in the New Covenant. Listen to this. This is John and chapter 7 and verse 16. So Jesus answered and said, this is John 7, 16, My teaching is not mine, but him who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks, verse 18 of John 7, from himself seeks his own glory. Do you realize there are some people presenting truth for their own glory? But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true. Who's true? The one who's seeking the glory of God, right? And there is no unrighteousness in him. So he's speaking specifically to Jesus, bringing truth straight from the Father, saying, I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to make him look good. We exist to glorify God. We exist to make him look good. We exist to reflect what he's like. Just like the moon comes up, the moon has no light of itself, but the moon every night comes up beautifully, doesn't it? Because it's a reflection of what? It's reflecting the sun. It's reflecting the brightness of the sun. You and I are to exhibit, we exist for his glory, not for our happiness. And when your enemy sins against you, you have to make a choice. 
It will not make you happy to go love them, serve them. But it will bring God glory, and ultimately you will have what? Joy. You know, joy comes from making God's glory the object of our lives. Or, continuing in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, he says this, Let your light shine before men in such a way they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. What do your good works, what are they designed to do? Glorify God. Do you know God gets glory when you love and forgive your enemy? Do you know God gets glory when you give sacrificially to serve others and care for others? Do you know God gets glory when you come under a boss, according to Philippians, or Titus 2, who's unreasonable? Boy, that makes me happy. Why do, I, why do you submit to your boss that way? Because it makes me so happy. It doesn't make you happy. But you can give glory to God and you can find joy. Why? Because if God is allowing my boss to be unreasonable, but my goal is the glory of God, then I can take joy in the fact that I am representative of Christ for his glory. It wasn't about my happiness to start with. So when it doesn't feel good, it doesn't matter. It's for his glory. Hmm. The glory of God. Or again, back to John. In the chapter 14 of John and verse 13 he says this of his glory, John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why does God answer prayer? For his glory. Sometimes we end up thinking he answers prayer for my happiness. If you take the path that says, I am living for my happiness, you will be quickly angered. You ever met someone who's quick to get angry? <laughs> We all have met somebody quick to be angry, and we've all been that person, right? Do you know that when you live for your happiness, you will be easily angered? Why? Because everything interferes with your happiness. About the time you actually think you're going to save something, the tire blows out, the transmission goes out, right? About the time you think this is just going to be the most wonderful Thanksgiving, you know who shows up, and they've got their comments ready for you, right? So you say, man, if you're living for your happiness, you will go through life very frustrated. But if you're living for the glory of God, you can be very at peace. And you can say, God is for God and I'm for God. You see, a lot of times in this world that's based around happiness, it says, this is about me, it's my happiness. Even truth is subject to my happiness. In other words, you should never question it as long as it makes me happy. And by the way, to that culture, they say this. If God exists, he should exist for my happiness. If he doesn't exist for my happiness, I don't want any part with him anyway. That's culture, isn't it? The Bible says we exist because he created us each uniquely for his glory. And we've got to tie into that if we're going to come under his authority, if we're going to believe his word, if we're going to follow his ways, right? John 17, 1. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. You know that Jesus had one objective on this earth, to glorify who? The Father. And he only has one objective on this earth for you and I, to glorify the Son. Because when we give glory to the Son, the Son then in turn gives that glory to the Father. That's the only reason we exist. That's the only reason our heart pumps blood, our lungs breathe air, is for the glory of God, right? The glory of God. In fact, the only reason he saved us is for his glory. This is what Ephesians says in Ephesians 1.3. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So are we for, does, do we want God's blessing? Yes and amen. Is God for us? Yes. Does God love us? Yes. Right? So we're not against that. We're for all that. Right? Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of his Glory. Why did he choose you? For his glory. Why did he redeem you? For his glory. He actually says this again in verse 12. To the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his 
glory. Or again in verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. Even the fact that we understand Scripture is for his glory. In fact, in John 16, he says this in verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, who's the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit, right? The third person of the Trinity. So when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose it to you what is to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says, for he will take a mind and will disclose it to you. So Jesus is glorifying who? The Father. The Spirit is glorifying who? Jesus, right? And so why is the Spirit revealing this as true? I like what Rene Jr. had said this week. He said, man, these things used to seem to be fuzzy, but all of a sudden they've come into clarity. Like I used to read these things and go, ah, yeah, okay. Then. Now it's like I read these things and then he's going, how can I live it? I just got to live it. I want to I know this God. I want to live for this God. What, what accomplishes that? Not us. It's the Holy Spirit that illumines the Word of God for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Here's the problem. 500 years ago, the Reformation happened in order to throw it back into the centerpiece to say, we've got to glorify God. How had they missed that? They had missed it because they had missed the first four solas, right? They had missed the first four solas. And so they were robbing God of his glory. When we have something other than God's word as our authority... We're robbing God of his glory. We're saying, okay, the scripture's nice, but, but what? Do you have another authority? Oftentimes we do, and so we just say, well, that's your interpretation. That's nice, but I see it differently. Well, we may misinterpret the scripture, but there's only one interpretation. And we need to be going back, not to say, this is what makes me happy, so therefore, this must be what the Bible's saying. But rather, we need to say, this is what the Bible's saying, therefore, I need to glorify God. What is it saying? What is it saying? What you'll find is that God runs contrary to culture. And we are often shaped by culture. If you spent much time behind the TV or radio last week, you were being shaped by culture, right? I'm not saying throw all your TV. I'm not saying don't read news, not listen to radio. I'm saying that everything around us is telling us about God and ourselves, a worldview. And then the Bible comes along, and Jesus is very different. He doesn't, take, he doesn't go to the right or the left, right? He takes the path of life, and he calls people to follow him. But to do so requires dying to self. And so they were robbing God of glory by turning to a different authority, or in Christ alone, um, God is glorified when we as sinners recognize that this salvation is in Christ alone, that there's nothing of us other than that we are simply coming to God in his grace, given faith to believe, and recognizing the Son of God. So that in John 3, 16, God is glorified. We understand that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we recognize that, when we say, it is not of me, it is of Christ, we're glorifying God. When we say, it's Christ, Christ plus me, we're robbing God of what? Glory. You see, God is glorified by offering his life as a ransom, and anything added to that robs God of his glory. Even taking communion. Some would say this is transubstantiation, that somehow the body and blood of Christ is, is again, this becomes the blood and body of Christ every time communion is offered. Robs God of his glory, doesn't it? Because Jesus said it was finished. So if we're saying it's not finished, but in fact we re-crucify Christ each time, we're robbing God of his glory, aren't we? You see, we have to be careful, don't we? Either God has spoken and the authority is God's word, or it isn't. If it isn't, you're in the wrong classroom. And you should go looking for the right God. If it is, then we shouldn't kind of, you know, just kind of, Oh, hum, well, I think it's okay. I talked to a guy. You can pray to saints. You can pray to Mary or Jesus. It's all the same. You're robbing God of his glory. Read Hebrews. There's one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is not okay to pray to dead saints. It is appropriate to pray to Jesus Christ, the living, ruling, reigning Lord of the universe. To pray to anyone else is so strange. It would be like somebody coming in, and you see their shadow, and you go to their shadow, and you're like, please help me, shadow. You're like, they're standing right there. This is awkward, right? You're robbing God of his glory. You see, if you read the Bible, you find that God is fiercely in tune to his glory. My glory I will not share, he says. God is for God. What our question needs to be is, what does God want from my life? In fact, I want to share one more verse with you and then a few thoughts. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 10, and verse 31, he says this. This is the fight verse this week. He says this. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. A suggestion or a command? A command. A command? Do you know God doesn't give too many suggestions? We make his commands into suggestions when we rob God of his glory, right? What would it mean for an infinite being that we call God, who created the world and all things in it, who sustains the world by the word of his power today, who will one day right all wrongs and judge all mankind and accept into his presence all who by grace, through faith, received his redemption? What about this God? And what, when he makes a command like this, ours should be wild. Okay, he commands. He doesn't make suggestions. He makes commands. He gives the Holy Spirit so we can fulfill them. But think about this. Whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Think about this Thursday. Whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. How are you going to eat food this Thursday on Thanksgiving for the glory of God? It seems a pretty mundane thing. On What about tomorrow when you're eating toast? I don't know what you eat for breakfast, but whatever you eat for breakfast, toast and yogurt, whatever the deal is. Let's say you're sitting there. I know a lot of you guys really like cookies for breakfast this morning. It's pretty tasty. Maybe you'll have cookies for breakfast with Jose tomorrow. The fact is, whatever you're, if you're eating cookies in the morning, how would you do that for the glory of God? That's a mundane thing. How are you going to drive your car for the glory of God? How are you going to speak a word to your spouse for the glory of God? You see, that should be our thought process. If God is for God and God is for his glory, and that is why I exist, then it's not about my happiness, it's about his glory. When I start to make my life about his glory, all of a sudden I can have a deep-seated joy in my life, right? And instead of a lot of this craziness we see the world pursuing that we also fall into, we can say, not evaluating each decision this, that comes tomorrow based on what do I want? What would make me happy? What would make me most comfortable? What would I most enjoy today? You start to say, what would most glorify God today? You deny yourself the happiness, but you will ultimately find the joy that's long-lasting if you set your heart and your mind on happiness, you'll be easily angered. You set it on God's glory. You'll be settled in joy that it really is, at the end of the day, about God anyways. Didn't have to turn out your way. Didn't have to turn out your way. Because he didn't create you or me to make life about us. He created you and me to bring him glory. If you set your heart and focus on happiness, you'll make You'll reason away or make excuses and dismiss certain passages that infringe on your happiness. You go, love my enemies. Man, I just unfriended them this week because of that tweet that they gave me, right? Love my enemies. No way. In fact, he must have meant something other than that. But if you're set on God's glory, you say, God, the word is my final authority. Whatever you say goes. Even if they are my enemy, I will love them. Even if they've hurt me, I will bless them. Even if they've spoken ill against me, I will speak well of them. Even if they have taken from me, I will pray that you will bless them. Big difference, isn't it? One is very emotion-driven, me, 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 and we live in that culture. The other is God is for God, and I'm going to glorify him with my life because I was made for that. If you set your mind on happiness, 
you will actually pick a church based on what makes you happy. If you set your mind on the glory of God, you will pick a church based on what will make you holy. Because your desire is for the glory of God. Now, I'm not saying there shouldn't be happiness in it. I'm saying that ultimately, why would you even get married? Hopefully, even getting married or all the decisions we make is so that we can better what? Glorify God. When we make all of our decisions based on this will make me happy, we follow the culture. We may sprinkle it with some Bible verses, but ultimately the path of life is in glorifying God. We exist to glorify God. We exist to glorify. I hope you meditate on that this week. God is for God, and he created us to be for him, and he knows that we find our truest sense of why we even exist and joy and peace in life by our lives being about the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we know the Son was set on glorifying you in everything, everything you said, he, he said. Everything you did, he said, whatever I see the Father doing, that I do. He wanted to glorify you. Every thought, every action, every deed, he wanted your glory. He wanted to reflect the amazing character of the Father. Now we have this opportunity through the Spirit to glorify you, Jesus. You are the risen, ruling Lord of the universe. You are seated in heaven even now. You are receiving worship from all the saints that have gone before us and all the angels. God, it is so easy for us to walk away from you and start pursuing our happiness rather than your glory. God, in whatever areas of our lives right now, I pray you'd reign conviction, that you would convict us, that we would turn away from the ways we've made life about our happiness and begin to pursue your glory. Lord, if anyone here has never even thought of living for your glory, never been saved and transformed and desired your glory above anything else, the day would be the day of salvation for them. God, please forgive us for the ways we've not made your glory our focus in life and refresh us and encourage us that you are for us, that you are with us, that you love us, that you have equipped us, and that all of these things as we pursue you and follow you, all of these equip us to glorify you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As the musicians come up, uh, feel free to come up and take communion, which is just symbolic of the fact that God has done everything to forgive and wipe away all of our sins at the cross so that we can live a life to glorify God.